Good evening. Candace, it looks like your hand is up. <laughs> there's a new, <laughs> no, there's a, like a graphic underneath you that says your hand is up. I guess there's a new feature in this. Um, Zoom just updated, and so I guess you can raise your hands now. And I get this little hand dealy bopper. Of course, I can't see that. But. All right, let me get set up here real quick. <clears throat> Anybody have any cool stories about their long weekend that they want to tell? No. Well, that's no fun. I was at work. What's that? I was at work. Oh, and that's no fun? Here you go. <laughs> Was it, uh, do you tend to be busier on holiday weekends like that? Memorial Day was yesterday. We were pretty busy. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it sort of depends on where you're located, whether or not they want to travel out to you while you're, uh, while it's um, holiday weekend. Do a lot of people come out and go golfing on that golf course? Swinomish? There was a couple. Yeah. Yeah, since spring started, we've we tend to have a couple of, like stay in plays like per day, weekends, uh, quite a few. No, yeah. how much do they charge for uh, for greens fees or whatever you call those things? I have no idea what a greens fee is. I haven't heard of it. All I know is if you want to book a stay in play package, mm -hmm. it's um, either regular price or your promotional offers, and it's an additional upgrade fee of about thirty bucks per person. Inclu <laughs> yeah, it includes the cart and tee times, and I don't know. Some of it's in unlimited golf. Nice. That's pretty reasonable. It seems I don't really golf, so. I'm don't know what the average course fees are to play nine or 18 holes, but 30 bucks seems pretty reasonable, especially if they're thrown in a golf cart. <clears throat> yeah, I don't golf. I don't know. I've tried a couple times and I'm just like digging a hole where I'm trying to hit the ball. <laughs> I think at a, at a certain point, it's not even about playing golf. It's just about having a meeting on the golf course in a nice <laughs> setting. You know, a lot of, Older business folks like to do, I think. I'm not quite that old yet, so but I might get there one day. We'll see. Well, I better be good at golf then, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least you know the golf lingo. You don't want to be better necessarily than someone you're negotiating with either. You want them to feel good, so you might let them win. Good point. Yeah, I don't know. It all depends. <clears throat> well, I did uh, – we have this event up here in Bellingham uh, – every Memorial Day weekend called Ski to Sea. And it's like a uh, seven leg relay race. It goes from, the, from Mount Baker, or basically the Mount Baker ski area, all the way down to the waterfront in Bellingham. And there are skiing legs, there's running, there's biking, and there's uh, canoeing and kayaking. So I did the biking leg this weekend, and thankfully on Sunday, it, the weather was much improved. Uh, over Saturday, Saturday was pretty nasty out there. Um, but Sunday was nice in the afternoon, so I got to uh, 
uh, ride my bike over very rough ground and uh, have a day to recover from that yesterday, which was good because I was sort of hurting. But we did the college. I wasn't on the college team because we only had one team this year, but the Northwest Indian College team came in uh, 25th out of 325 teams. So they did really well this year. I think it's the best they probably have ever done. Um, so the Screaming Eagles, as we call the team now, um, yeah, we're in the top 10% of, uh, of all the teams, and I think they were third in their division or something like that. So it's pretty neat. <clears throat> That's pretty cool. Is it like street bikes or like mountain bikes or? Well, there's two biking legs. There's a road bike leg um, from Everson into Ferndale, which is about 42 miles. And then there's a cyclocross leg, which is what I rode. And that's just from Ferndale into Bellingham, it's 13 miles or something. But it's over all sorts of varied terrain. And so some people do use mountain bikes and other people use um, cyclocross bikes, which are just sort of like beefed up road bikes that can handle big bumps. So, um, and I did the, I rode my mountain bike two years ago and rode my cyclocross bike this year. And it's definitely a more comfortable experience riding a mountain bike, but you don't go as fast either. So, yeah, somebody was trying to tell me about that. We got a lot of guests who like to bike around here. I don't know. Every once in a while, you know, on my way to work, there'll be this big, huge line of cyclists with their, you know, I don't know what they're doing. Um, they're like going between the Connor Mount Vernon. Sometimes they're coming. I don't know. It's like a relay. Or I don't know if it's relays or I don't know anything about biking, but I see them around here quite a bit. Yeah. I think in general, the Skagit uh, Valley is sort of known for being a good place to bike. You know, they have a lot of uh, roads that have reasonable shoulders on them um, and a lot of flatness. So that's, you know, sort of nice. But, um, yeah, they do a, uh, every September they have a, what is it called? Uh, um, it's Bike MS, which is a um, fundraiser for the muscular, or excuse me, the multiple sclerosis um, society. And they have hundreds of riders that do that. And it sets off from Mount Vernon and it goes over Woodby Island, some of the routes go up towards, you know, through La Conner. And so, um, yeah, I think a lot of people rode bike in that area. So, That's no. probably who they were. Yeah. So, all right. So, so what we're going to do tonight, um, we're going to start off um, doing some extra credit with uh, time value money calculations. Um, and in just a second, I'll tell you how that's going to work. Um, just to review what we did last week, because I was hoping that you would get a chance to work on a few of the uh, um, time value money exercises in class um, before having an assignment, but it didn't work out that way. We ran out of time. So tonight I want to take about the first 30 minutes of class and um, basically. Uh, offer extra credit for five to six of these questions. And so how we'll do this, sort of like, um, sort of like a game show, um, is that you'll get five minutes per, um, per question and at the end of five minutes, and you'll submit all these with your, so hopefully you all know how to chat and you can all private chat me, um, the answer within five minutes and so you can click on the little chat box down below and then uh, just click on my name if you if you chat to everybody and you get the right answer then you might be helping everybody out but um try to chat to me that's that way it keeps it a little competitive um so we'll do that uh we'll do five or six of those questions just really so you get practice and also so you get an opportunity for some extra credit um in addition to Robin Williams. Um, in addition to just being able to practice these time value money calculations, because on the uh, last test, which will be surprisingly, I think two weeks from today is our last class, which means test number two. Um, you'll have a lot of these time value money calculations on the test, along with a few of the financial calculations that we um, 
we worked on from chapter four that were also on the first test. So, um, so practice is good, and, and we'll um, we'll do that. So let me, uh, if you log into Canvas, I'll show you where these exercises are. So under week number seven, um, well, I guess I already published them. Um, there's a, under resources, there's a link called in-class extra credit TVM exercises. So uh, what you can do is you can open that up and I'd also recommend you open up the blank time value of money calculations spreadsheet, which is the link right above that, um, because that's what we used last week to, um, it has some of the formats for those time value money calculations. And you can use that to actually complete some of these. And so, let me, uh, oops. so if you wanna open both of those up, then you'll be ready to go. And like I said, so we'll go through these uh, one at a time. You'll have five minutes to do each of them. And then uh, again, when you get the answer, send me a private chat with your answer uh, within five minutes. And then I'll go over each of um, the questions um, before we move on to the next one. So. So before we do that, before we start on this extra credit journey here, anybody have any questions um, they want to throw out first? No? All right, you guys are all good to go then, right? I just make that assumption when I don't hear from you. So, Wait, so you said the blank, the blank time money calculation spreadsheet? Yeah. And, and what was the other one? Uh, the one right beneath it, which should be in-class extra credit TVM, I think is what it's called. Okay. TVM for time value money. So, yeah, in the future, if I abbreviate something with TVM, uh, that just means time value money, these exercises from Chapter 6. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, so we'll start with the first one, and uh, this is a two-part question, so if you have time, you can do both parts, but start with the first part. Um, and see, again, the key here is to, one, determine what you need to find, and then determine what that function is, uh, whether it's present value, future value, rate, time periods, um, any of those variables, um, and then put those into the function in Excel and see what you get out from that. So we'll start with number one, which is the you invest $200 per month in your IRA for retirement. If you do this for 20 years and your IRA has an average return of 6%, how much money will you have when you retire? So start with that and then if you have uh, more time, you can do the second part, which is 30 years. So I'll start my timer for five minutes and uh, when it goes off then uh, We'll talk about the answers to this. Good luck.
Got about a minute left. All right, my beeper is going off here very silently, actually. All right, so if you have an answer you want to submit, shoot it to me right now, and then I'll go through these here in a second. <clears throat> Any other submissions? Hmm. All right, time's up. And unfortunately, I can say that uh, no one got the right answer, I believe, except for hopefully me, we'll see. Because I'm doing these while you're doing them too. So let me show you what I did and uh, hopefully you can see where you may have gone wrong here. So first of all, I gotta change this up here. Um, so this was asking about $200 per month, right? So we're going to put away, let's see what the $200 per month for retirement. If you do this for 20 years, um, and you have an average rate of return of 6% annually, so 6% every year, how much money will you have when you retire? So the way that you do this or what you put in here is one we're operating via months because you're putting in money on a monthly basis so you have to everything has to be based on months so the number of time periods is 240 which is 20 months or excuse me 20 years times 12 um, so that's 240 months in 20 years the other somewhat confusing thing might be is that you also have to convert the rate into the monthly rate. So if it's 6% per year, then how much is that? Well, I'm showing it to you right here. It's 0.5%. So you take 6% and you divide it by 12 months and that gives you your monthly interest rate, your equivalent monthly interest rate. And then the other piece of information that we got was that they were putting $200 per month into their retirement. And so that becomes the payment. Um, and again, because they're, the money is moving away from the uh, investor, it's a negative um, in this equation. And those are the three pieces of information that we were given. Um, the other thing that we just have to know or have to interpret is that the present value for this would be zero because they're starting with zero. Um, they're starting to contribute $200 at some point, and before that, they have zero. So, so those are the four variables that you need to have to find this future value here. And the value for 20 years, based on um, that information, should be $92,408.18. Let me turn up the zoom here a little bit. So you can see that better, hopefully. Can you guys see that all right? Got some nods, okay. Um, so that's what would be after 20 years, and 30 years, which is the second part of the question, would be $200,903.01. And to, to do this one, the only thing that I changed was the number of time periods, um, because everything else stayed the same. So instead of being 240 months, it was actually 360 months. That's 30 times 12 is 360. 
So at the end of 30 years, it would be $200,000 um, approximately. Okay. So that was a future value question. Uh, wanted to find out what would happen in 20 or 30 years. Any questions or comments about that one? Either of those two. No? All right. Well, let's head on to the second one, which is um, about purchasing a home. It says, you found a wonderful home and are interested in buying it for $275,000. If your bank is willing to give you a 30-year loan at 3.75% interest per year, what would be your monthly payment? So hint, you're going to have to convert all of the variables except for the purchase price into months to figure this one out because you're looking for a monthly payment. So, all right. So I'll start the timer and let's do this one. And there's a second part to this question too, if you get it, get to it, which is just changes the interest rate to 5%. Um, Well, we got one correct answer. Actually, we have two correct answers for this problem from the same person. We got another correct answer. Excellent. There is no down payment on this problem. So assume the loan is for 275000 
Happy Bell rings. Anybody else have a answer they want to throw at me before we go through these? So far, two people got the right answer. It's an improvement. All right. So. <clears throat> Let me show you what we have here. So this was uh, a payment problem. We were looking for payment, right? A monthly payment. And so this is what I did. Um, the answer to A, which was the 3.75% interest rate, should be $1,273.57. And the way I figured that out, um, so when you're dealing with a loan, um, you start it's a negative present value because you're taking on a debt. It's something you're gonna owe and you're gonna have to pay at some point. So you'd enter that amount as negative 275,000. And again, because we're looking, uh, we're trying to find a monthly payment, you have to convite, convert your time periods into months. So 30 years times 12 months is 360 months. And then the same thing with the rate, you have to convert that 3.75% rate into a monthly rate. And so this is the way that you can do that. Um, if you look up above here where my cursor is, um, you basically just divide, you put in the rate first. So I'll show you how this works because it's a little, can be a little quirky. So if, you're, if your cell is a percentage, and again, you can look up here to see what format your cell is. If it's already a percentage, all you should have to do is type in, whoops, like 3.75. So you get that in. But the second step to convert this to months is then to put an equal sign in front of the 3.75 because we're going to have it calculate something for us. And then you just divide that by 12. And that should give you, then it gives you your monthly interest rate here, which is 0.31%. And so uh, then you just, uh, once you have that, these three variables is, all you need. The future value for these will be zero uh, because at the end of 30 years you will have paid off your mortgage and you will not owe anything. Um, so I just leave future value blank and I crank through the payment uh, function and I come up with $1,273.57. And then for the second part of the question which was what happens if your interest rate is 5%, um, the same thing here type in 5% and then put an equal in front of it and divide by 12 and that will give you your monthly interest rate. And everything else is the same. Um, and so just with a change in interest rate, your payment goes up to 1476.26. So $200 increase per month just because the interest rate went from 3.75% to 5%. And we're gonna be talking about interest rates today. So this is sort of good prep for that. Okay, so um, like I said, two people got those correct. Um, anybody have any questions about how I did that particular problem? No? All right, well, let's go for another one then. Uh, let's do number three, um, which is an, excuse me, an annuity question. And just before we start this, can anyone tell me what an annuity is? Give me a definition so we're all working off the same page. Let's see. Jessica, can you tell us what an annuity is? Yes. Well, I was trying to talk. I didn't know if my mic was on. It wasn't coming on. Um, isn't an annuity um, something that you pay towards uh, getting a lump sum at the end? You make payments or you get payments from a company for investing in their company? Yeah, pretty much. You. So what happens with an annuity is that you give an investment company a, a lump sum at the beginning, let's say it's $100,000. And 
sign a contract, and in exchange for that, they agree to pay you a certain amount of money for a certain amount of time. So maybe you give them $100,000, and they say, okay, for 20 years, we will um, we will give you $1,000 a month for 20 years. And so you're converting your $100,000 in present value money into these payments over the next 20 years. So it's uh, you know, it's an investment that some retirees like because then it guarantees them a certain monthly income for a certain period of time. So, so yes, that's, uh, that's what an annuity is. And so in this, in number three, um, the question is, um, a company offers an annuity that pays $1,500 per month for 20 years and they charge $150,000 for this annuity. That means that's what you pay up front. And the question is, what is the average rate of return on this investment? So that's the question. All right, so the, uh, again, and this is uh, something that you need to pay attention to, whether it's months or years. Um, and I'll give you credit whether your answer is in an interest rate for a month or a year. So take it easy on you a little bit here. All right, five minutes. And like the other financial calculations, if you could uh, give these answers to two decimal places, please. All right, we got one correct answer.
two correct answers. Five minutes. Anybody else want to throw one out there? Two correct answers so far. No. <clears throat> All righty. So this is the equation what's highlighted in blue here is what we did for to figure this out and so this was a rate question it was asking um, what is the average rate of return on this investment and again i said i take both monthly and yearly um, and so the entries would be fifteen hundred dollars per month so that's a positive number because it's money coming towards the investor um, 240, 20 years or 240 months or the time period and negative $150,000 present value because that's what you have to invest to get this stream of payments for 20 years and a future value of zero after 20 years, it's not worth anything. And so put all of these into an equation, a rate equation here and it came up with 0.88%, but because payments and time periods are in months, this is the monthly rate, so you need to keep that in mind. So it's a 0.88% per month, and the way we figure out what the yearly rate is, is we just multiply this by 12. Monthly rate times 12 gives you your yearly rate. So the yearly uh, annual rate of return is 10.52% for that. All right, any questions, comments about that one? <clears throat> no? Okay, we'll do one more here and let's see which one we want to do. Let's do number four and Number four is that the U.S. government is selling a 10-year bond that will pay $1,000 at maturity, i.e. in 10 years, it'll pay $1,000. If you are seeking at least a return of 4% annually, what is the maximum you would be willing to pay today for this bond? And the second question, if you get to that, would be, what would you be willing to pay for it if it also paid an annual coupon of $20 for 10 years? And the coupon is just an annual payment that the bondholder gets uh, for an extra, for, for twenty dollars every year for ten years. So, all right. So, do this for five minutes. And by the way, the reason I'm doing these for five minutes is because five to seven minutes is approximately how long you would have to work on one of these for a test. So, this is good practice. All right. Good luck.
No one, correct. Two correct. All right, last one. Throw me an answer if you got it. Any more? All right. So let's go over this one here. Okay, so this was a present value question. It's asking what you would be willing to pay today for this bond. So what is the value of the bond today if you wanna make 4% a year for 10 years and get $1,000 at maturity? So the way that you calculate this is you don't have to convert anything to months. Uh, for this particular problem. It's just a 4% rate. So that's what you'd be willing to, that's what you need to achieve at least 4%. Um, the number of time periods is 10 years. The future value is 1,000. Um, that is all you need for the first part of that question. And if you crank all those in, it's an equal PV function for present value. Then you come up with $675.56. If this particular, so that's the most you would be willing to pay. If it costs less than this, let's say it costs $650, then you would still wanna buy it because you would be earning more than 4% at that point. Again, because the less it costs, the more it needs to, essentially your return is to get to that $1,000. So instead of making $300, $24.54, if it was, let's say, $600, then you would actually make $400 um, as opposed to $324, which is what you would make at 4%. Um, and then the second part was, what's the present value with a $20 coupon? Again, a $20 coupon is an extra payment that you get every year for 10 years until maturity, and then you still get the $1,000 at the end. So if there's a coupon, if, if there's a question like this, and there will probably be a question like this in your homework where they say, what's the value of this bond? And then what's the value of this bond if it has a $20 coupon? The $20 coupon will always be worth more because if you think about it, you're, you're getting more money over that time period. Not only are you getting this $1,000, but you're also getting 20 bucks every year on top of that. So, so the the value for that bond with a twenty dollar coupon added is eight hundred and thirty seven dollars and seventy eight cents. That's how much you would be willing to pay if you were seeking to earn four percent. All right, all right. So that's sort of um, anybody have any questions about any of those four? That's sort of all we have time to do right now. 
there's going to be a time value money assignment for next week, another one. So you'll have more, more opportunity to practice. No other questions, comments? All righty then. Um, I would really, I, I do highly encourage you to spend some time working through these problems and actually I'll leave that, um, I'm gonna save that worksheet and I'll post it um, under week seven, probably tomorrow so that you can, if you want to try to work through those problems or at least look at how those uh, functions, how I created those functions and came up with the answers to those problems, then you can review that and compare it with the actual questions themselves. So make a note to do that. Okay, so again, that's just the same, uh, those are the same types of problems we worked on last week from chapter five, time value money. And so for the rest of the time tonight, uh, we're gonna talk about chapter six, which is one of, we're gonna do chapter six and part of chapter eight um, next week. And that will be the last, those will be the last sections of this uh, textbook that we, um, we work on because the week after next will be the last class and thus the last test for this class. So, um, so chapter six is about interest rates and we're going to be talking about how financial institutions and lenders come up with interest rates for things like homes and cars and other things, and what factors go into influencing interest rates, and also how interest rates influence people's behavior and the economy in general. Um, and so just to start out with, can anybody tell me uh, what, I mean, aside from being a percentage, if you're looking for, say, a loan for a home or a car or anything else like that, how would you, define or describe the interest rate that you're going to pay. What is that? I'll give you a hint. It's the cost of something. The interest rate is the cost of borrowing the loan, right? Yes. Yeah, the interest rate, or in even simpler terms, the interest rate is the cost of money, the cost of you being able to to get that money. It's what um, you'll have interest expense to pay on on top of the amount that you're borrowing, right? It's the charge essentially to give you the money to buy something, whether it's a home or a car or anything else, or a credit card for instance. Um, and so interest rate is really just a, a way to think about uh, how expensive money is to get. And there are many factors that influence that, but um, you can think about it in the same way as other, the prices for other assets like stocks and bonds, um, real estate. It's essentially the interest rate to a large degree is determined by supply and demand. So if everything else being equal, there's a higher demand for money, that will gradually push interest rates up because there will be less money to give out and thus the people who are lending money will start charging higher interest rates because they know that they have, um, they know that there are a lot of people out there who are demanding money. Um, if the supply goes up and there's a few ways that the um, Federal Reserve or the, the United States government bank can increase the supply of money without actually printing new money, um, but they can have that impact. If the supply goes up and the demand stays the same, then the interest rate will go down. Um, and so it's just like, uh, let's say oil. For a while, oil prices, and they still are, a lot lower than they were, say, two years ago. That's because to a large extent, demand has gone down 
fairly significantly because of some slowy, slowing economies in the world, like China, for instance. And so as demand goes down, if the supply stays the same, then the price of oil is gonna go down. The same thing for interest rate. If the supply stays the same and less people need money, then eventually the interest rates are gonna go down too. So I would just think of the interest rate as the price of money. Price of money that you don't have, but that you may want to acquire. And you can think about it from two expense or two perspectives: one from the person who's borrowing it, or from the uh, perspective of the creditor or the entity or person who is lending the money. Um, certainly, you have different interests there. The creditor wants to get as high interest rate as possible, and the borrower wants to get as low an interest rate as possible. And so that's where the supply and demand dynamic dynamics come in to match suppliers and demanders of money um, and and how the e uh, interest rate comes to equilibrium so um, so I wanted to show a brief example of sort of how that interest rate function works um, real simply in Actually, I could probably use that spreadsheet we were just working on here. Yeah, this is a good way to look at it. So let's see here, which one was, oh, so this one right here, the present value. So this was the last um, problem that we worked on. And it was the bond that matured in 10 years, at, had a value at the end of $1,000 and, and the rate, the interest rate was roughly 4%. Um, and this was the present value. So what I'm gonna do though, is show how the interest rate changes when that, when the, when the, uh, the price changes. And so I'm gonna create a new equation down here. I'm gonna use the same information, 10 years, thousand dollars in the future and we won't worry about present value or pay actually we will put in 650 as present value that's what it's worth today and then we'll calculate the interest rate I'm going to do that over here so it's a little easier to see so this will be the interest rate underneath here that we're calculating so I'm going to do my rate in per payment, which is nothing, present value, which is $650 in this example, and future value is 1,000. Let me add some. So that comes out to, um, if I were to buy this bond that paid me a thousand bucks in 10 years, um, that would be the equivalent of, of earning 4.4% interest. Um, or, if you think about it in the other way, if the government is selling this bond, they're having to pay you 4.4% interest for you to give them the equivalent of, uh, six, well, $650 right now is what you would be giving them. And so if you wanna see how this interest rate changes, let's say that, so everything else is gonna stay, stay the same except demand for money is going to, demand for this bond is going to decrease. And so if demand for this bond decreases, what does that do to its price? Does it increase the price or decrease the price? Anybody? It would decrease the bond, right? It would decrease the price, right? Demand goes down, so not as many people wanna buy the bond, so the price is, uh, is gradually, or maybe not so gradually, going to fall. It will fall to some degree. And so let's say that because of decreased demand, this price goes down to $550. For a 10-year bond, excuse me, for a 10-year bond, that will pay me $1,000 in 10 years. If the price is at 550, then this interest rate goes up to 6.16%. So that means from the government's point of view, they're getting less money up front. They're only getting 550 bucks and they're gonna to have to pay $1,000 in 10 years, which means their, their equivalent rate of interest that they have to pay you to give them your money is 6.16%. So as demand goes down from the, from the supplier side, from the people who need the money, the interest rate will actually, uh, will actually increase. And 
the other direction is the same well it'll happen conversely in the other way let's say demand for these goes up and so more people want these bonds if we go in there and say demand goes up and thus the price goes up to negative seven fit or not negative 750 it goes up to 750 dollars if you want to buy this bond then that pushes the interest rate way down to 2.92 percent so if there are more people in the market for bonds, that's gonna push the interest rate on those bonds down. If there are less people in the market for bonds, that's gonna push the interest rate up. This assumes that the supply side stays the same, but that's in general how demand can impact interest rates. Um, so if you're, if you're looking for a home loan, for instance, and the supply of money is gonna stay the same, but there's a lot of people who are looking for loans, gradually that will pr push the interest rates up. If there are less people looking for loans, then at some point gradually, or maybe not so gradually again, that will push the interest rate down. So interest rates are, um, just like other assets, are influenced by supply and demand. So um, you don't really maybe think of interest rates as an asset or maybe in the same way as a house or a car or something like that, but they're influenced by supply and demand um, in the exact same way. So any questions about interest rates and, and how those, um, how supply and demand impacts interest rates or vice versa? So. Okay, so that's just um, an initial introduction here. Why don't we go ahead and take our, uh, our break right now since it's 6.05. And um, let's break until 6.15 and then we'll come back and we'll get uh, into more specifics about interest rates and calculations in the economy and things like that.
Okay, how about we um, get rolling again so we can get through stuff in chapter six. Um, I want y'all to know about. So continuing on with um, the interest rates, um, the next thing I wanted to just talk about is how the level of interest rates can affect the economy, uh, any economy, the US economy, any other economy as a whole. Um, and so I wanna give you some examples of how things look in a low interest rate environment and how things might look in a high interest rate environment. Currently, we're in a very low interest rate environment. Um, home loan rates are the lowest almost that they've been in 40 years. The last two to three years, it's hovered down at the bottom of where uh, home loan rates have been. They've never been this low. Right now, for a 30-year loan, you might be able to get a home mortgage if you have good credit for three and a half percent. So um, it's pretty low, which means you're paying a lot less in your monthly payment as interest than you would be otherwise. Um, so in general, when interest rates are lower, one, that just lowers the cost of capital because if you're borrowing money to buy equipment, to buy a car, uh, to buy a house, to buy anything. If you're borrowing money and you're paying less interest expense, then it costs you less to actually acquire that capital, right? Because the interest portion of that cost is gonna be lower if, uh, if it's a lower interest rate. Um, and with lower interest rates in general, one of the things that happens is people will tend to want to buy more today, especially buy more things that they need to rely on credit to get or loans to get because if interest rates are lower right now, then again, it's gonna be much less costly for them to acquire an asset, whether it's a car, a house, a piece of equipment, new building for a, a, a business, um, anything really. If, if there's a loan involved and the interest rate is lower, then that will tend to encourage people and companies to want to do things, to wanna to purchase things now, utilizing the cheap, cheaper credit. Um, on the other side of that um, equation is it also makes people and businesses less willing to put money in interest bearing savings, investments, bonds, or things like that. Because if the interest rate is lower, then they're earning a lot less uh, than they would maybe like. Uh, for instance, right now, savings accounts earn probably around 0.5% each year, which means if you stick 100 bucks in your savings account at the end of the year, you're gonna have 50 cents more. Woo-hoo. Um, so there's not a whole lot of incentive, especially right now for people to, and, and companies to some degree, to save money because the interest rates are lower. So if they're not gonna save, then they're gonna spend. That's the other side of the coin, right? Um, so if, things are turned around and interest rates are higher now, both to borrow and to save, then the exact opposite happens. People are less likely to buy things today because they're going to be incurring more interest expense. And they're also more likely to save because not only would they be spending more on interest for these purchases, but now, um, assuming the interest rate uh, yield curve is normal, then their savings account or their investments accounts would also be paying them more in interest. And so they would be have more of a motivation to save, to put money into, you know, a savings account, an IRA, you know, whatever sort of investment account that pays interest because interest rates are going to be higher. Um, and so the Federal Reserve of the United States, which is the central bank, uh, and a central bank essentially is just the government's bank, um, it can print money, can print dollars. It um, typically doesn't, or it hasn't in, in quite a while, at least it hasn't increased the number of dollars in circulation, but it can influence the amount of money which is the supply side of the whole interest rate equation. It can influence 
a perceived amount of money by making credit easier for banks to get. Because what the Federal Reserve does is it has a short-term lending uh, rate for banks. And that just means that banks can access money on short terms from the federal government at very low interest rates so then they can go out and supposedly make loans for things like homes and cars and you know all the other things that commercial banks make loans for. Right now, I think the uh, lending rate uh, from the Federal Reserve to banks is about 0.17%. So it's not even a quarter of a percent, it's 0.17%. And so banks can then take this money that they have borrowed from the federal government and loan it out for people who want a loan for a car or for a house, and then they charge this higher rate of interest, right? If you're, so even if you're getting a home loan at a very good rate uh, at 3.5%, if the bank is utilizing funds from the federal government to, to, uh, to loan to you, then they're still making the difference between 3.5% and 0.17%. And so that's like 3.33% just on, on a home loan and on money from the federal government. And so, um, so the, the federal government can make interest rates to some degree, um, at least short-term interest rates, uh, move a little bit by making money easier to get for banks and cheaper for banks too. And that's one of the reasons why since about 2010, um, interest rates have been on a steady decline to where they are right now because the the Federal Reserve saw that the housing market was crashing in 2008, 2009 when we had our Great Recession. Housing prices went down and home sales went down and there was a real concern that this would continue and that, and that home prices would suffer a pretty catastrophic um, failure or decrease. And so one of the things they can do to stem that decrease, well, how do people typically buy houses with loans? I don't know, I don't know many people who buy houses with cash. I don't hang out with that group of people. Um, so most people are buying houses with loans. Therefore, if the interest rates on home loans go down, then more people are gonna be willing to buy houses, which is gonna prop up to some degree the home prices because it's creating more demand for homes and thus eventually home prices will go up. So the central bank for at least five, six years now has been working to keep interest rates really low, which then props up home prices. and also to some degree allows people to buy cars that they might not otherwise buy. If you've noticed um, over the last few years, there's a lot of 0% offers or 0.9% offers for new cars and things like that. So those really low interest rates also create a demand for other assets that uh, people rely on credit to purchase. So uh, cars and, and homes, um, probably heavy equipment for business. Um, if they're gonna be buying on credit, that would be more attractive for them to purchase right now because of this low credit. And so, these are some of the ways that interest rates can sort of have an impact on decisions that both individuals and businesses make in, in the US economy and any economy really. And so the government can play a hand through the Federal Reserve and their lending practices to banks as to what happens to interest rates. They don't have complete control, but they can certainly influence it. And they have been doing that pretty significantly since about 2010 here in the United States. One of the problems with maintaining low interest rates for long periods of time though, is you've created this demand. It's, a, it's an elevated demand. It's a demand level that wouldn't exist without, uh, to some degree, without these low interest rates. And so it makes asset prices like houses and to some degree stocks right now um, go up because you got more demand and you still have the same amount of uh, houses or maybe uh, a few more houses, but not as much as the demand has been created. They don't increase that rapidly. And so you see these prices go up. That's inflation, right? So if you see asset prices go up and it starts to trickle down to food products and things like that, then all of a sudden, all of the assets that you've been buying are starting to cost more. And so a little inflation, like between one and 2% a year, 
um, businesses and governments don't mind. They can sort of work with that and they can count on the fact that that's going to be a, a, a fairly low level of, in, uh, of inflation rate that things will gradually increase in price. But if you maintain these really low interest rates for a long time, it could cause inflation to go up even more significantly because you're, you're amping up demand. And, and if you have the same amount of products and you have much more demand, that's gonna cause the price on those products to go up eventually. Um, we haven't had a seriously, or we haven't had a, a sort of a, a significant increase in inflation over the past five years, although economists are saying we should watch for it. We should be careful of what they call asset bubbles, which just mean that asset prices are going up and at some point they might pop, uh, which is sort of like what happened to housing prices in 2008 and 2009. But there are economies in South America where they've seen inflation um, literally go to 100% or more. So in a year, so basically what you could buy say with $1 uh, this year, if it was 100% inflation, that, would, that same item would cost you $2 next year to buy. And so inflation, of, that's called hyperinflation. Inflation at that level is not good for, certainly for the economy, for businesses, for the government. It makes long-term planning really difficult because you're seeing these significant de uh, increases in prices every year and maybe it varies quite a bit along the way. And so it's extremely difficult for businesses and the government to do any long-term planning, financial planning certainly, because prices are so unstable and going up at such a high rate. So in the, in the long run, that's what um, there's fear about maintaining uh, interest rates, low interest rates, manipulating them to a low level, is that eventually it will cause these asset prices to increase and maybe increase at a higher rate than than the government or businesses would like to see. So interest rates will go up at some point. It's just a question of when and to what degree. Um, the Federal Reserve is trying to gradually bring them up. Um, there's, uh, they have some fear that if they do it too rapidly, then it might cause businesses to, and individuals to reduce their buying significantly and have a pretty, uh, could have a negative impact on the economy. So they're trying to do it very gradually. And they do it in about, they've been doing it in quarter point increments. So they'll maybe increase at 0.25% and wait three to six months and see what the impact on interest rates and the economy is in general and then maybe do that again. Because the other thing that low interest rates um, cause is it causes the economy to be more active because there's more, money is cheaper, so there are more projects that would make, fun, make uh, sense for businesses to do when the interest rates are lower. And so one of the calculations that you worked on in chapter four is called return on assets, ROA, right? And that's just a measure of how much money a company makes off of their assets, all of the assets they have. And one of the ways that you can use that particular ratio to determine if it makes sense for you to, uh, as, a, as a business, to launch a project, launch a new product or upgrade a portion of the business or buy a new piece of equipment is you look at how much interest you're going to be charged for that particular loan. And if the interest rate is higher than your return on assets, then it doesn't make any sense to pursue that loan. Because what that means is you're going to be adding a certain amount of assets. Let's say you got a loan for $100,000 for whatever, and they're charging you 5% interest on that. If your return on assets is only 3%, Think about it this way, you've just added $100,000 to your assets, and if on average you're earning 3%, but you're paying 5% in interest on that loan, you're actually gonna be losing net roughly 2% on that investment, because you're paying more in interest than you're actually earning as a return on the asset you're, that you're buying. And so that's one of the very um, sort of broad ways that companies will look at whether or not it makes sense to do a new project. How much are you expected to make on that project and how much interest expense um, are you expected to pay? And so when the interest expense is lower, 
then a lot of projects look good. If interest is only say 2% and you have a project that earns 3%, then you might consider it because you're still making money. But if that same 3% project, you're in this environment where the interest rates are 5%, then it doesn't make any sense because you're gonna end up having more interest expense at 5% than you will earning on your return on assets at 3%. So um, as a general rule of thumb, if your return on assets is higher than interest expense, just purely from a financial point of view, might be a good investment to consider. But if your return on assets is lower than the interest rate that you would be charged, it almost never makes sense to do that. Um, it, at least it just for that project, it will be a losing uh, financial proposition for the business. <clears throat> so that's one of the ways that, that companies or one of the factors I should say that companies or organizations should use to evaluate whether or not they want to um, entertain a new project is the value of the expected return on that project versus what they're expected to pay in interest on it, on a loan for the project. Um, so that's one of the ways that, that interest rates can, or the cost of money can affect um, the economy or affect decisions in the economy. We've already talked about some of the ways that low interest and high interest can affect savings versus consumption, consumption being purchasing decisions. Um, the other thing to keep in mind that's, uh, that I mentioned before or just recently is about the inflation rate. So as the inflation rate grows, companies desire or companies need for a return on the investment also has to grow because if you're investing in something uh, let's say a project that you expect to earn you a five percent return for the next 10 years um, if inflation is running at about two percent let's say as an example which is maybe about where it's been it's been one to two percent um, the last few years then you actually have to take that inflation rate and subtract it from your returns because over the next 10 years, you're gonna be losing approximately one to 2% of purchasing power every year, right? Things are gonna become more expensive. So even if you make the same amount of money this year as you do 10, or 10 years from now, you're gonna be able to buy a lot less with that amount of money because, just because of inflation. And so inflation is another, the inflation rate is another factor that businesses have to take into account and actually individual um, investors or savers have to take into account when they're thinking about what they want to do with their money. Um, because for instance, right now, if you put your money in a savings account and earn that big old 0.5%, if inflation is running at 2%, then you're actually losing one and a half percent of your purchasing power every single year because things get 2% more expensive every year but you're only earning 0.5, you're only earning half a percent. So you're only increasing your amount of money by half a percent. So you're actually losing purchasing power um, every year. And so just based on inflation, nothing else. Um, and so these are both the interest rate, the, the interest rate for loans and the interest rate that you'd earn in the bank and the inflation rate also impact decisions both for businesses and individuals. Um, in the, in, in the country. And that's why the Federal Reserve is very interested in making sure it tries to manage the interest rate in a way that will be good for the economy as a whole. Certainly, that's one of their goals. All right, um, any questions about uh, any of that information, either on inflation rates or interest rates or the impacts of those? So it's based on supply and demand. It's like the price of money, the cost of money, the value of money, and the Federal Reserve, the central bank, have the power to manipulate the increase or decrease of inflation and interest rates um, for pretty much the whole economy. Well, they have the ability to influence interest rates, not necessarily inflation rates. Okay. Interest rates will influence inflation rates at some point. As I said, if you keep these interest rates low for a long enough time, 
then inflation will gradually tick up. Things will gradually start to get more expensive, right? Because um, if more people could buy, uh, per, if more people's purchasing power is at a higher rate, then eventually the the demand for products or services will grow at a higher rate, and being able to keep up with that will um, cause the the rates to to increase because it'll virtually be a little less available for the public is it something like that so the if if the demand increases and you have more people wanting to buy let's say the same amount of houses or the same amount yeah, yeah let's just use houses then that's gradually going to increase the price on those houses because more people are willing more people are in the market for a house and if there's the same number of houses or or um then the the house the prices on those houses are invariably <clears throat> excuse me and go up and that's inflation inflation is just the increase of price really in any asset got it yeah and so when the government works to try to keep interest rates down they're also really creating uh, an elevated demand and increasing demand got it so yeah. <clears throat> all right any other questions? Okay. Um, where are we at 636? So one of the things I want to go through with you, and I think there's a great graphic in your book. I think it's on page 189. I also just put it under week seven in Canvas. Um, let's see what I called it. I think it's figure 6-1, six, 6-1 one, six one on page 189. And in Canvas, it's just labeled Chapter 6, Interest Rate Equation. I'll share my screen here so you can see it too. But um, this is sort of, uh, this is the equation for how interest rates are roughly figured out. Or at least these are some of the... Um, factors that go into influencing what a quoted interest rate is. So I'm going to go through these real briefly. And you can view this as, as uh, just like any other equation. You can take the sum of all these five things here, these five variables, and you add them up and you have the approximate interest rate um, that a bank would charge or maybe a bank would offer um, for one of their savings accounts. And so I'm going to go through these variables. It's the main thing here is to just understand what the variables represent um, and why they contribute to either an increase or a decrease in the interest rate. So I'm going to start out with, um, so R just stands for what this is the quoted interest rate. So this is the outcome of adding these five variables together. The quoted interest rate is R and R star which is sort of hard to see here. But um, this first variable is called R star. And it's R star is the risk-free rate of interest. That means if there was an investment that had no risk at all, that you would lose your money, then this is what you would earn on that investment. And typically um, in the U.S., this is understood to be um, the 30-day T bill, which is a 30 day treasury bill. It's a bond that the US government sells, but it's only for 30 days. It's super short term. And so the reason it's seen as risk free is because one, it's so short term that, you know, it's very unlikely the world is going to come to an end in 30 days. So there's, there's a very low amount of risk, one, with the time period, and two, the fact that the US government is the one offering this bond and the US government is sort of seen as the maybe the safest government to loan money to um, that creates this um, this risk-free rate of interest and if we go to let's see if I'll, I'll just look this up here 30 day T bill T bill rate just to see what it is today and, there's all sorts of good sites where you can see <clears throat> these rates. This is actually the Department of the Treasury. So this is the, the um, Department of the U.S. government that manages um, money and influences interest rates. 
And so you can look down here and see, let's see here, is that where we're at right now? Yeah. So four weeks is obviously, again, the, the amount of time that a 30-day treasury bill would be, and it varies per day. And it's gone up this month from, it started the month at 0 0.10, so 0.1 of a percent, and right now on the 31st is at 0.27 percent. So this first part of the equation, R star you can think of as 0.27 percent right now. That's what you would earn if you invested in a 30-day U.S. T-bill, U.S. government T-bill. So that's the first part of this uh, equation. Um, the Second variable here is uh, IP stands for the inflation premium. And so when we talk about premiums, what we mean are things, risks that you're taking as an investor on top of this risk-free rate here. So any risk, and so there are gonna be four different types of risks that we're gonna talk about <clears throat> that you could take as an investor. And to take that risk, you want to earn a certain amount, right? There's, you need to be paid for taking a risk on an investment. And so <clears throat> we'll look at these different risks. And we'll start with IP, which again is the inflation premium. And all the inflation risk premium is, is what do you expect the average inflation to be over the uh, time period of your investment? So if you're investing in a 10-year bond, you'd want to know, what is your expectation for inflation for the next 10 years? So if your inflation or if your expectation for 10 years, next 10 years was on average 1%, then your inflation premium would be 1%. And that's what you would put in here. Um, if you expect it to be 3%, then you'd put 3% in here. And again, we're gonna be at the end, you add all these up and this is approximately the quoted interest rate that you would expect based on all of these variables. So just keep that in mind. If you inf expect inflation to go up at a higher level, then in the end, your, your rate of interest should also be higher, just based on the, inf uh, the inflation premium. And that sort of goes back to what I was talking about before. If you expect things to cost more in the future, that's gonna take a bite out of your earnings, right? If you're earning 5% on investment, but inflation goes up, by 3% every year, you're really only gaining 2% of purchasing power. And so that's why the inflation premium um, is included in this, in this equation to figure out the quoted interest rate. Um, DRP stands for the default risk premium. And this premium essentially um, is the chance that the borrower will not be able to repay the loan. So if it's the U.S. government, that default risk premium is probably close to zero. Um, for individual borrowers or business borrowers, it's based essentially on your credit history and your credit score. And so if you have a, this is, this is how uh, lending institutions, banks, and, and other mortgage brokers tend to use the default risk premium when you're looking for, say, a loan for a house. They will run your credit score and they have some algorithms to determine if your credit score is within a certain range, then your default risk premium would be this. The lower your credit score, the higher your default risk premium will be because you're a higher risk. And so they're gonna wanna charge you more interest because they feel they're taking on more risk. If you have a higher credit score, which means you're less likely in their eyes to default on the loan, then they will charge you a, uh, a lower default risk premium. And so your quoted interest rate, everything else being the same, will be lower also. Just stop me as I'm going through here. I'm just, uh, I wanna define these and then I'll show you sort of how it works. <clears throat> so that's the default risk premium. Um, LP stands for liquidity premium. And the liquidity premium uh, sort of harkens back to uh, what we talked about, current assets and current liabilities, some of those equations. It's basically how quickly can the um, investor turn that investment, whether it's a bond or a house or anything else, back into cash. If they can do it immediately, if it's traded on a public market, then the liquidity premium 
is going to be fairly low. If it's a private, um, if it would be sold on the private market, like a piece of real estate, a house, um, a car to some degree, then the liquidity, liquidity premium will be a little bit higher because it will take longer to turn that particular asset back into cash. So the quicker you can turn it into cash, the lower liquidity, liquidity premium will be, and the longer it takes you to turn that asset into cash, the higher it will be. Okay. And finally, the maturity risk premium, MRP stands for maturity risk premium. That's the risk that the longer the investment that you have, the longer you're gonna hold the asset, just in general, the amount of time, stuff can happen, right? More stuff can happen in the next 30 years than can happen in the next 10 years, just because there's more time. So the economy can change, um, asset prices can drop, um, unemployment can go, can skyrocket. These are all potential risks that can occur in the future. And so the longer into the future your investment goes, the higher the maturity risk premium will be that something might happen. An earthquake might destroy you know, half of Washington state or something like that. Um, so the shorter the uh, maturity, the shorter amount of time that you're gonna hold the asset, the lower the maturity risk premium will be. So this is really just a time factor thing. Uh, the MRP is just about time. And so in the end, if you, if you get values for each of these, and this is what lenders do to some degree, they will, they'll certainly have R star here. And they'll have the real risk-free rate of interest. You can get that off the treasury website and that changes every day. You'll have to make some educated guesses about what the inflation premium will be over the course of time. Um, for the default risk premium, you gather some information about the person who's borrowing money or the, uh, the organization, the government or the business that's borrowing the money to determine how big of a risk it is that they won't be able to pay back the loan that you're giving them. Um, liquidity premium again, how quickly can you turn that investment back into cash? And then the maturity risk premium is just time. So from this, I like to go to this site. Um, this is a good site for all sorts of things, bankrate.com. Um, so if you want to have an easy way to calculate monthly payments, say for a home, home or something like that, this has all sorts of calculators up here. And you can actually click on this calculators link. And they have calculators for retirement, for mortgages, for personal finance, for investment, all sorts of different calculators to calculate auto loans, home loans, credit card payoff calculators. There are some good tools at this site. Um, but the main reason the site is here is because they're also marketing loans. Um, and so let me get away from that. And so one of the things you can do from this homepage here, one, it shows you today from the financial institutions that are lending on their site, what the average rate for home loans are. This is uh, uh, refi rates right here. You can look at new home loans and they're slightly different. You can look at auto loans here, um, the average rate for auto loans, average rate for CDs, what you would be earning on a CD from some of these financial institutions and also checkings and savings. Um, so there's a lot of good tools here, but what I wanna show you is has to do with uh, home loans. We're gonna use that as an example. And so you can use these two steps here and you can click on, I wanna find a mortgage um, for, and I want a 30 year mortgage, let's say, 30 year fixed mortgage, which means the interest rate won't change over the 30 years. I wanna lock it in, that's a fixed rate mortgage. And let's just say my loan amount is 200,000. Let's say I do have 20% down, which for most conventional loans, you will need 20% down for if you haven't purchased a home before. However, there are all sorts of uh, programs for new home buyers where you don't have to have 20% down. So just an FYI. Um, but you can also select the time period here um, because you can 
get a 30 year home loan, you can get a 20 year, you can get a 15, a 10, um, all sorts of different options. And so I'm gonna click 30, 20, and 15 so we can look at all of them. Uh, I won't pay attention to points right now. Um, the FICO score is the credit score I was telling you about. And so it allows you to put in approximately your credit score. It has a few ranges here. We're gonna start with the top, which is over 740 um, as a credit score. And so I put all this stuff in, and then I'm gonna click on find rates. And so this will give me approximate rates from a number of different lenders based on that criteria. So first of all, I'm gonna sort by APR, which is the yearly interest rate. Um, or the average annual percentage rate. And so you can see that with this criteria over here, um, I'm looking at for a 30 year fixed mortgage, 3.375% uh, is the lowest uh, currently, which would mean about $884 a month um, in, uh, as a payment, okay? So that's for a 30 year mortgage. But if we wanna think about this, maturity risk premium, that's just the difference in time, right? So what's the difference between say a 30 year mortgage, which has a long period of time versus a 15 year mortgage and maybe a 10 year mortgage? So it should have brought up all of those. If we go down far enough, yeah, here we go. So they organize them, they put all the 30 year mortgages first and then they get down to 15. Well, you can get a 15 year mortgage for 2.75% and the only thing that's changed here is the amount of time period. Your credit score is still the same, the amount of loan is still the same, so the only thing that's changed is the time period. And going from a 30 year mortgage to a 15 year mortgage reduces your rate by about, uh, from, from 3.375 to 2.275. 2 uh, excuse me, 2.75. And so that's about three eighths of a percent. Uh, no, excuse me, that's about five eighths of a percent difference. So 0.625 less for a 15 year mortgage than a 30 year mortgage. And the only reason that is, is because the maturity of the loan is shorter for a 15 year mortgage. So this thing, MRP, has decreased by 0.625 because everything else is exactly the same. If we go back here and go down to 10, I don't think there's gonna be a significant, oh, this is 20, I did 20, not 10. So for 20, actually, there's not that big of, there's not a difference at all, uh, actually, between a 20 year and a 30 year loan, because a 20 year loan is 3.375%, and a 30 year is the same. So you don't get that sort of break from the maturity risk premium until you reduce your mortgage, um, duration to 15 years from 30. So that's one example of how you can see a maturity risk premium influence an interest rate. The other thing we can do on this site is we can change a credit score. So if we leave everything else alone and just change our credit score and go from really good credit at 740 down to 660 to 679, uh, which is the lowest level of credit they let you put in here, and just see what that does to um, our rate. So remember the 30 year rate is 3.375 and the 15 was 2.75. So if we change it to 660, we lower our credit score, then this is what happens to, let's see here. This is what happens to the interest rate. So it goes up about an eighth of a point. So the cheapest rate we can now find is 3.5% on a 30 year mortgage. And the other thing that it does is it reduces the number of lenders who wanna to lend to you because now we only have three lenders who would be willing to lend to us for 30 years and then we skip right down to 15 years here, right? And so all of a sudden we're at 15 and now the lowest, we can still actually get a supposedly a 2.75% loan from US wide financial, which is an online lender, but there are only three organizations, again, who would also be willing to lend to us at this lower credit score. And interestingly enough here, on a 20-year loan from Sabonic Financial, we would actually be paying more, we'd be paying 4.15% because of our lower credit score here. 
So this is the DRP change and the default risk premium essentially can be thought of as the influence of your credit score on your ability to get credit and on how much they'll charge you. One, it decreases the amount of lending institutions who want to give you money. And two, for the ones who remain, they're going to charge you more because they see you as a higher risk with a lower credit score. Okay. Um, okay. So that's just sort of a demonstration of how both time period and credit scores can influence a quoted interest rate here, which is R in the end. Any questions about anything I just showed you from, from here, bankrate.com, or about the credit uh, quoted rate of interest equation here, this one. No questions? Okay. Uh, well, that's essentially all I wanted to cover for tonight out of Chapter 6. And so for next week, if you look back on Week 7 on Canvas, basically there are um, two assignments and then um, Chapter 8 reading. So Chapter 8, again, is going to be the last chapter we cover. We're going to do that next week. So read that uh, prior to class so we can have some good discussions, hopefully. And there is uh, another time value money assignment. So um, it's right here. And the actual problems are up here under resources. So you can click on time value money assignment number two. And then also from the book in chapter six, and make sure you pay attention to this, there's question 6-2, and then there are problems 6-2 through 6-5. So you have one question, 6-2, and then problems 6-2 through 6-5 for next week. And those focus on um, using that interest rate equation to solve some problems. Okay. All right, that's all I got for you tonight. Uh, anybody have... Anything you want to ask me, scream about, cry about? Nothing. You guys make me nervous sometimes when it's so quiet out there. Make me happy and talk to me more. All right. Well, if not, have a good week. And if you have any questions on any of this, you can email me, call me, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I did also, um, I got through... I graded everything up through what was due tonight that had been submitted in Canvas. So if you haven't checked Canvas, if you haven't seen and you had submitted something and you hadn't gotten a grade on, it should be graded now. So, all right. All right, well, have a good week, great week, and uh, we'll see you next Tuesday for our last official class before we have the test. So, all right, see you all later. We have one question. Yes. Are you getting our grades for the Rebuilding Native Nations online? Yes. I haven't posted those grades, but I, am, I get a report basically every week on where everybody's at, so I just need to enter those. They're sitting in my email box right now. So. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Oh, hey, Steve? Yes. Did I see you change the date on the due date for that time value? Um, for next week? I, I got a notice on my um, canvas. Let me pull it up. Due date change. Oh, it says chapter six. Okay, hold on. Due date change, due date change. Yeah, at 204, assignment due date change, time value money calculations two. Oh, says two, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I was, well, yeah, I changed. So some of these are already set up from the previous quarter, or at least the assignments. And so I just have to go in and change the date. Oh. Usually I'll do it while they're unpublished. So you shouldn't get a notice that the, they're being changed. But I think this time I didn't change it until after I actually published it. So. Oh, okay. So, so, All right. Yeah, I get it. It's confusing. All right. Sounds All right. good. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Later. Bye.